Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week we're following in the footsteps of the past couple of episodes where we've previewed Super Formula and GB3. But this time we're here to prepare you for the upcoming season of the Formula Regional European Championship by Alpine, or Freca for short. To help me dig into everything you need to know about the 2022 season, I'm delighted to say we've got a driver who will be racing in it. It's the Italian and German F4 vice champion, Tim Tromnitz. How are you doing, Tim? I'm very good. Um, really looking forward to, to uh, start on Monza now. Yeah, it's not long away, is it, this weekend? And while Tim is doing battle in the impressive Frecker calendar, more on that shortly, one man who will be watching every single second of the action, it's commentator Chris McCarthy. And we didn't scare you off after you joined us way back in episode two, Chris. How are things? Yeah, very good, thanks. You know, really, really excited to, to get the season underway. It's, uh, it's been a been a long way. Uh, it's been really interesting to follow pre-season testing, though, and uh, seeing the entries pile in, you know, 36 on the grid now for this weekend. It's great to have Tim with uh, Tim here as well, you know, new team tried in uh, on the grid, coming in with a really good lineup as well. So, yeah, I just want to get over to Monza now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. I think that's the best track to start it with. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, really looking forward to it. Well, we'll have to make you go through an episode of the podcast before you can get there, unfortunately, Chris. And finally, we have the debut appearance of another F1 feeder series editor to give their expertise on the championship, especially after being on the ground at pre-season testing of Paul Ricard last month. So Frecker editor at F1feederseries.com, Percy Wolf. Welcome, Percy. How are you doing today? Thank you very much for the introduction, Jim. And yeah, I'm fine. I'm very fine. And yeah, obviously, I'm very excited to see Freke back on track this weekend. Uh, I'm always excited when a championship is starting its new season, and especially when it's Freke. Uh, uh, I love this championship, and even more after visiting the paddock at the Paul Ricard last month. And yeah, I think we'll, we'll talk about it later in the, in the podcast, but it's going to be a great season, a really great season. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hyped. I can't tell between the three of you genuinely who's most excited about it. So three different people from three different <laughs> angles. It's brilliant. But before we get into it, a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening to the audio only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform that you're using. It really does help us out. So let's get into it then. All about Freca this week. And it's a championship people are familiar with. There's a lot of new rookies, a lot of returning drivers. One of the rookies going in is Tim. What are you expecting from your rookie season? It's not the easiest championship for rookies after all. No, I mean, um, the, the grid looks, looks very good, um, very competitive. Um, yeah, but I'm really excited and me and the team, we worked very hard over the winter and yeah, let's see what we can do this year. Now, the winter work you have done, how did you find things went compared to how you expected things to go? Um, I think, yeah, first it was for sure about um, yeah, getting to know the team and also even more the car. Um, and then we just started to to work on um, on driving for sure um, all these things uh, we do, and yeah, just focusing focusing on yeah different points in the team um, to improve all the time, getting better and better now up until the last test. So yeah. And with Trident being a new team coming into the, the championship, are you finding that they know exactly what to do? They've got success, they've got success last year, F3, before deciding to do this. Is that something you think's buoyed them? Yeah, I mean, for sure you have to sort things out at the beginning. But, um, you know, the team is very, very experienced. Um, like, they won a lot of races, um, championships. Um, so... All the team structure and everything is pretty much the same also like in the other series. So for sure, um, there are some new things with the car, but um, we use the testing for that. So, yeah. yeah. As a team, Trident are one of the uh, the ones who know what they're doing, don't they? And 
Well, you can talk a little bit about that, Chris, as well, because you're back as the official Freca commentator. Congratulations. What are your expectations for this season? Uh, and we've got here as well, what do you love about the championship? <laughs> Oh, everything. You know, I think the, the main thing I love about it is the size of the grid. Um, you know, 36 cars on the grid. It's absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and the, the quality of the field as well is so, so impressive. I mean, you only have to look at how the, you know, we had nine drivers go up to F3 from the championship. So that's almost a third of the grid filling F3. And everyone's raving about that this year. And you have to, only have to look at how well those guys are doing uh, out there. You know, Franco polled it. Uh, Gregor's doing really well. Um, and so I think the quality it has stayed again this year. It's probably even improved a little bit. New teams as well, who I think are going to be really quick straight away. Uh, and the quality of racing has always been pretty good all the way throughout. I don't think, uh, the thing I like about this year is I don't think there's going to be a, a single driver run away with it like we had last year. I mean, when you look through the entry list, it is really, really hard to, to put your put your finger on on a winner so uh yeah i think i think it's uh i think it's going to be really cool and the fact that we've got some new things coming into the championship this year makes mm -hmm. it even more exciting i will talk about that in a moment and just a quick note from you chris as well to put you on the spot and offend potentially tim's team we've got a new team coming in how are you expecting trident to handle their first season in freca i think they'll do just fine honestly i mean uh testing they look really quick they're always in the top 10 uh, I know they were, I think they were 9th, 10th, 11th uh, at Monza, which I think they'll be very pleased with. I think it'll be very similar to Van Amersfoort when they jumped into F3 and F2 this year. They know what they're doing in single seaters. It's not going to take them a long time to get their head around the car. And, and they did that incredibly quickly. I think with Trident, they've got so much success that you know they'll get their head around the car really quickly. And they're only a year behind everyone else when you really think about it. We're only in our second season, so... It's not like they're going into a championship with a 20-year history. It's only got a year, so they've not got too much catching up to do, but uh, the strength they have in that team off track and then uh, on it as well, like with Tim, who we have joining us, uh, yeah, I think I think they're going to compete, definitely. That's a really valid, valid point, sir. Uh, and I hadn't thought of it that way, only one year behind, but we saw how Honda struggled one year behind in Formula 1 those years ago. I don't think you'll be repeating that. <laughs> Just try to, yeah, a lot of success there. Um now, Percy, there are some incredibly strong drivers returning. Uh, and there's also, as we know, some exciting rookies. How are you seeing the championship battle unfold, both in the team's championship and the driver's championship? To be fair, it's very hard to predict the outcome of the season because uh, there are so many experimented drivers, so many exciting drivers, uh, returning drivers and rookie drivers. And if we look just at the preseason testing, the natural favorite would be Gabriele Mini, who was absolutely flying. And it was, yeah, quite quite amazing. And uh, RGP has always won the title since they have joined the championship with uh, Victor Martins in 2020 and Grégoire Soucy in 2021. So, yeah, I think for me, it's maybe a favorite, but there are so many drivers who would have deserved their place in uh, Formula 3. Uh, like that, obviously, I think of uh, Adrian David, who was vice champion last year. Um, we didn't see him much in testing, but last year, too, he was very discreet. And finally, he finished runner-up with several, a couple of wins, I think. So I'm sure he will fight for the title. And but these two won't be alone. There will be also Paul Aaron in uh, entering his third season with the support of Mercedes. There will be Casper Colt, who was also fast in pre-season testing. There was there could be Michael Belov. There could be Bartolito, Beganovic. I mean, you see, there are so many title title contenders. It's yeah, it's gonna be really really great year. And for the for the rookies, uh, sorry team, but I think it will be a bit more difficult for the for the rookie drivers because they have some experience to to gain and they have um, they have some very good raw speed very good potential but most of them are not in established top teams like prima ART or RAs that are usually always in the top and uh, i think we will have a one season to learn one season to win as it was the case uh, formerly uh, in the in this championship and uh, given the level of the field this year i think the rookies will have to learn as much as they can to have a good progression 
to maybe fight with the returning drivers at the end of the season. But I think it may be a little short to fight for the championship. But I think it be very interesting drivers to, to see, to watch. And uh, I'm thinking about the uh, team, obviously, about Montoya, Capieto, Van Huppen. There are so many exciting drivers. But yeah, for the championship, I think it's going to be difficult. Now, prove me wrong. <laughs> Tim, are you going to prove him wrong? Are you going to go for a championship fight this year? I know it's going to be difficult to set an expectation, put a number on it. But how high up the grid do you think you'll be? And also to put you on the spot a little bit, who do you think will be challenging for the title? Um, yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. Um, it's it's very tight, um, but for sure, my goal is just to, to learn as much as possible. And um, I think I can do that um, also together with the team's experience. And I think um, if we just take, yeah, all the, the positives and stay positive all the year and just keep on focusing on our job the results will come for sure um but yeah of course uh, the goals are high and um yeah um that's why i'm racing you know and a name for a championship i know you'll hate to have to boast or to support another driver uh, anybody in particular you think either from the rookie field that you're familiar with or people who are returning to the championship will be up there at the end of the year um yeah i mean um like i already said it looks very tight so it's very difficult to predict anything um <laughs> you should be a politician tim yeah but but i mean um they're yeah like drivers who have already a lot of, of experience like um david for example in his third year now um so yeah for sure for sure they start the season with an advantage knowing the car for, for a longer time and things like that. So, yeah. We'll, we'll see. I'll accept that as an answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, we spoke about Monza briefly. Um, the championship calendar is mostly the same. There's uh, the swap out of Hungaroring going in, Valencia going out. But the order, Chris, is somewhat different. How are you viewing the, the championship calendar and any particular highlights for you that we're going to see? One, exciting racing, and two, any tracks in particular you're excited to go to? Uh, I mean, I know the drivers were a big fan of going to Monaco. I think that's the, the flagship event. Uh, again, you know, supporting the, the F1 is, is a huge opportunity for the drivers to uh, not just to go and, uh, and support F1, but support the F2 teams as well over there. So I think that's a, a really good opportunity for them. Uh, and overall, I think I can really pick out one circuit because I, I think a lot of the circuits we go to, the drivers will then go to an F3 as well. So I think this is a, the calendar once again is uh, to have that consistency is very, very good. So, uh, but yeah, some of the ones I really liked, I, I really liked Mugello. I thought that was a great circuit. I think it has a bit of everything, to be honest, when you go, there in person you really see how how huge the elevation changes are uh red bull ring uh provided some really good racing last year i think that's uh another one really good uh and monza's a great circuit as well but yeah there's no there's no what standout ones in particular i think monaco is is good but i think it's good the organizers have kept consistency you have that one swap out valencia wasn't intended to happen last year it had to happen because of covid uh but i think the hungara ring is a more suitable circuit uh, given that's where F3 go and race. I think the Hungara Ring is one of those really underrated circuits as well. It's such a good karting track almost, isn't it, with how tight and twisty it is. Tim, have you been to every single circuit on the calendar? Uh, no, not yet. Um, but there will be uh, collective tests before. So, uh, yeah, shouldn't be a problem. Any particular ones you're most excited to get to out of the new ones that you haven't visited, let's say? Yeah, I mean, for sure, Monaco is a highlight. Um, also Spa. Um, but yeah, one of the best comes comes at first now. Monza will be very exciting, um, especially with, uh, yeah, with the racing. It will be very close and, yeah, very interesting. And yeah, Budapest is also very nice. Yeah, Monza with 36 cars is an absolute 
<laughs> feast for the eyes. Chris, I'm not very <laughs> jealous of you whatsoever having to call that into the first corner. And Percy, you were yeah. boots on the ground over at Paul Ricard, the racing there as well. Anything in particular you took away from testing and, well, the rest of the calendar, calendar as a whole? Uh, yeah, it was very good, uh, a very good experience to be at the pre-season testing, to, to be with all the teams and etc., to be with the drivers. And it, it gives a different perspective of what, uh, what we see uh, be behind the screen. Uh, we see really people working. It's their whole life. It's, uh, I mean, it's so interesting. So, uh, yeah, we, we learn a lot of stuff. And there at Paul Ricard, it was the first time I went to Paul Ricard and uh, very good experience, very good experience. Uh, I've been able to do, to do a lap around around the track to uh, so it was really really interesting but i think the most important event of the calendar i know it's not original but it's obviously the monaco monaco event monaco round because it's in it's with the formula one grand prix and i think i would have preferred to see a bit more uh rounds with uh, with formula one as we had last year last year we had three rounds uh, with formula one and there, there is only one, there is only Monaco, which I think will be the most important one because uh, last year it's Isaac Adjar who won there, who did pole position, uh, etc., who dominated the weekend. And the evening after, uh, the same evening after the race, he was signed to the Red Bull Junior team by Helmut Marco, who was so impressed by his performances. So I think it's really... It's really great to have uh, Freke in support of Formula One. It's uh, yeah, it's a great thing for drivers to shine in front of the F1 teams, in front of the F1 academies. So yeah, it would be the the main event for sure. But obviously, there are so many interesting tracks. I mean, Monza, Spa Francorchamps, uh, Red Bull Ring. It will be it will be great. I, I think I would have preferred a bit more some tracks from Germany that we don't see anymore. I think Tim will agree with me. <laughs> Uh, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, Okenheim, Number Green. Uh, I mean, these are historical racetracks. We have always seen some incredible racing there, and yeah, so we don't see them in F1 anymore. We don't even see them in the case. So yeah, it's a bit sad, but uh, the calendar is still extremely beautiful, and uh, we go with ten of the most incredible tracks in Europe. So drivers will learn a lot of stuff, a lot of different types of tracks and uh yeah it's gonna be a great it's it, it is a great calendar and uh yeah now let's uh let's get started for monza absolutely it really is it's one of those calendars that if you were able to go to every race like some lucky people do you're actually getting a tour of the european classic racetrack so very jealous of those that can and percy just let's stick with you for a second because this year there's the introduction of uh I don't know if it's controversial yet, but much talked about, let's call it, of a push-to-pass system. Could you give us a brief introduction to that for those who don't know? Yeah, so push-to-pass. So uh, last year, uh, one of the main problems uh, inconvenient of the championship was that uh, even if there was a very tight field with some incredibly close gaps in qualifying, there were not a lot of overtakes in the during the races. It was one of the main problem. It mainly comes from the cars, from the tattoos uh, that are quite heavy. I think Tim will know more to how to talk about that to the, because I've never driven this car, obviously. <laughs> but, not yet. Um, <laughs> yet, obviously, <laughs> obviously. But uh, uh, so yeah, it's very hard to overtake with these cars. So Freke and uh, so Freke has decided to introduce a push to pass uh, a push to pass we, which will allow drivers to have uh, to use a boost of uh, power uh, during the during the races they will have uh, five uses of 15 seconds uh, during the races and uh, it is supposed to help overtakes uh, from what i heard in testing uh, it has not been up to the expectations at least concerning uh, in, the, in the point of view of several drivers so maybe it doesn't it won't help as much as expected 
and uh, we will we will have only the answers after several rounds because I don't think we will have the answers after Monza because last year in Monza there were a lot of overtakes already because Monza is a track that helps overtakes with the long straight with the harder um, breaks and uh, so I think we'll have more the answer after Imola after. Yeah, Monaco, anyway, you cannot overtake on this track, but after Imola, after Paul Ricard, Zandvoort, etc., I think we'll have more answers about this push to pass and uh, if it will help for the drivers. Yeah, well, there's only one person here who knows how it's working in practice and not in race trim yet, Tim, but are you noticing, uh, well, I know you can't really refer to last year because you weren't in that same car, but is, are you noticing a big improvement of power when you push that button um there, there is there is a bit more power but um yeah you can't really you don't really feel a huge difference um yeah i mean it's good that it's now already like we can already use it now in fourth gear because it was too late in fifth gear um to use it there um but yeah at monza it's true i think We'll not really see um, how big of a difference it will be because Monza is a track where you can always overtake, I think, uh, in any car. Um, but I think at tracks like uh, Zandvoort, um, Budapest, um, yeah, I think these are the tracks where we really can see um, yeah, what difference uh, the push to pass will make. Um, but I think it's yeah a thing uh, like everyone has to sort out first um, because it's new, obviously, and things to understand with it, uh, where to use, when to use. Like uh, There will be tactics for sure, also in the race, when to use it, and it will be not easy. Are you expecting it to be not only push to pass, but also push to defend and then almost nullify the effects of the of the intended use of it yeah i think um depends on the situation of course if you have a big gap to the guys in front um and you're fighting for a podium position or for p1 um then it only makes sense to use it for for defending but um on the other hand you have to be also a bit careful with um, if you use it and the one the car behind you can save some push to pass Mm -hmm. um yeah and you have nothing left towards the end then you're sitting duck maybe uh yeah you will see chris people had issues with drs had issues with fan boost in formula e they will have issues with push to pass because that's what formula fans formula racing fans do don't they if there's two states are in not happy with how things currently are and things should change that's the only two states that we have how are you viewing push to pass, especially after last year and uh, the requirement for it? Yeah, I, I like it. Uh, I like the the fact that they're trying something. Uh, you know that this was recognised by the championship throughout last year. Uh, you know, towards the end of last season, uh, I remember chatting to the guys about you know the, the some some sort of change coming in. Everyone would think it would just be DRS, but I know that's quite an expensive thing to implant on a car, so. Uh, they've installed push to pass. Uh, now, it's not been run very often uh, in feeder series. Uh, I know Indy Lights run it. Uh, but the last championship, other than that, I can really know is Formula Palmer Audi here in the UK, which was more than 10 years ago. I think that they had a push to pass system. Uh, so, you know, it, it's something, if the driver's not happy with it or they don't think it's up to scratch, then... Uh, the teams will work with the championship this year to make it better and better. Uh, it's it's not going to be something that's going to be a hundred percent good off the off the bat. I don't think we can expect that, but it's a step in the right direction. You know, it, it's it's going to help in some way. So uh, I think it's a, a good a good step from the championship to do it. They could have just left it as it was, uh, but instead they've listened to the the drivers and the teams and. and they've decided to, to give this a go. And I think that's the best thing about, you know, working with the organisers is, you know, that's one of the, the main things that they did throughout last year is, is try and work with the teams as best as possible. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. I mean, it's, it's only going to help, right? It's, it's only going to help some overtaking. So, uh, so yeah, I think, I think it should be great and it will just keep getting better and better. 
Chris, do you worry things like this are too artificial, though? That is, I'm saying this for devil's advocate because I do agree with the things you say, but that is a constant criticism I see with push to pass with DRS, with anything that's not just pure car racing. Uh, of course. I mean, if you when they go up to F3, they will have a DRS system. So uh, this is just an alternative, in my opinion. Uh, yep, you could argue that it's a little bit too artificial, but... It's used in IndyCar. It's used quite well over there. So um, I, I, I think we've got to get the, the drivers racing. Uh, you know, they've got to get used to overtaking each other. When they step into F3, they've got to be able to, you know, they're going to have a DRS system behind them and they'll be able to overtake a lot more. So if we can get the guys overtaken, uh, they'll get better at it. Not to say that they're not already, but we need to, you know, we need to, we need to get them used to overtaking uh, all the time and give them more practice like that. You know, in F4, the racing is absolutely fantastic. You don't want them to step up into Freca and then not have that you know, same ability to race. So. Yeah, well, I'll apologise to Tim for Chris saying that your overtaking skills aren't quite high, high enough. But <laughs> seriously, though, Tim, just a question on the on the testing when you were using it. We tried and asking you to, I don't know, drive behind your teammates and see how the system worked so you can actually have some practice of doing it rather than just doing hot laps? Um, I, I mean, it was more like depending on the situation, we were not, uh, yeah, like trying hard to get behind someone and try it there. Um, yeah, it was mainly for us uh, collecting also the data. Um and yeah but of course i tried also behind other people um yeah but it was it's it's difficult to say really uh to to get the feeling for the uh yeah for the how do you say i mean when to use it when you're behind someone um gap wise you know uh, to be close enough because um, if you press it and you don't have the advantage to overtake him at the end then it doesn't make sense to use it. So, yeah, but for sure, the, it helps, definitely. That's that's clear. But, um, yeah, we're, we are not sure um, how big of a difference it will be in the end. Now, as much as we could ask questions all day, F1 Feeder Series isn't for us. It's for you, the listener or viewer, and we want to make sure that you all feel involved. So we're moving on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. Now, if this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. Now, Tim, we're going to start with you with a question here from Gunther Lauch. And they've asked, is Tim following Ollie Behrman's F3 campaign? Could he join a driver academy soon? Um, yeah, well, of course, I'm, I'm following the FIA F3 season um, and all the drivers there. Um, yeah, I mean, um, he had a good F4 season last year and <laughs> for sure I'll give everything this year to to get picked up uh, by a junior program too. Was there anything in particular that you thought with you know, racing Ollie so hard last year that yeah, he had a good season? I think that's a, a little bit of an understatement. You both had terrific seasons. Um, were you surprised with the step up straight away? Did you think maybe it would be a frecker for him instead? Um, no, not really, honestly. I think... Um, uh, there, there are like a lot of some people sh already showed that it worked. For, ex for example, uh, Theo Poucher showed it um, that the step from F4 directly to FIA F3 can work. Um, and it, it doesn't look bad for him. I mean, uh, he's doing a good job there. So, yeah. Is it something you had considered for this year potentially? Um, yeah, for sure, we thought about uh, different options we have, but um, in the end, um, I think to, to yeah, I think you will learn a lot here in the Freca Championship, which will help you, um, yeah, in your motorsport career um, everywhere. Basically, you will go in the future. So, yeah, I think this is this is the right step. Oh, we certainly hope so for you. So we'll see how that all goes, and we've got. 
The question here, this one's for you, actually, Chris. Uh, CM Parfait 16, how gorgeous is seeing the Monaco racetrack in person for you? And what about the paddock as well? Oh, I didn't actually get to go to Monaco, and that'll be the case this year. I didn't get to go to any of the F1 events. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I commentated those from over here. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't actually know. I've not been there on a race weekend. I have been there uh, to commentate on a on an esports event and it is amazing over there. I, I don't know if Tim's been there yet, but when you walk the, uh, walk the streets of it, walk the circuit, it, it's a, it's an amazing place. I think it's something that any motorsport fan should, should go and see, but uh, I do hear the paddock takes about 15 minutes to drive to in a single seater car to, to get to the pit lane, to the paddock. I know it's a quite a bizarre drive to get up there. And I think it's in like a car park or something. I remember Zane telling me that they had to be in really, really early, like five in the morning because the cars are out so early and it takes, <laughs> it takes about half yeah. an hour to get from the, get from the paddock <laughs> to the pit lane. So it's quite a bizarre place in that sense. But, um, uh, but yeah, I, I, hopefully I get to go this time around, but, um, but yeah, unfortunately I'm not going to be there this year. So at the moment, are you visiting all the tracks minus Monaco because of the F1 issues yes that's correct yeah that's correct so i'll be at all the other nine but uh, not monica any standouts for that just from a commentator's perspective oh uh i mean spa's a really good place to go to uh you, you know that uh, we're there for the 24-hour race this year as well uh, which is a really cool event to, to support um monza is definitely up there for me though i love going to to monza i think it's a really nice place uh hungar rings also good uh in terms of standouts, I don't know. Maybe I'll pick Spa. I think Spa is a really good track to go to when, when you can stand trackside uh, and see any kind of cars going around there. It's it's a really cool place. Yeah, I visited not as a commentator, and it was spectacular. Um, I am very honestly, Chris. I know you're not going to Monaco, but I'm very jealous of the tracks you are going to. They are proper <laughs> racist tracks, aren't they? Next question very comes good. from Nine Live, and they wanted to know, Tim. We kind of touched on it earlier, but what are your targets for this year? Do you have a particular place in mind? I know you mentioned before, it's just learning the, the series, learning the track. Yeah, I think um, to develop myself and learn as much as possible is a good goal, especially for the future. Um, and if we do that, if, if we focus on the important things and focus on what we have to do and just keep improving, then uh, the, was, the results will come. And... Uh, yeah, it's difficult to predict now, like I already said. Yeah. Is there anything from last year that you think you did have to work on that you have worked on over the winter? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, um, yeah, like in a four, the last year was really, uh, yeah. You know, I was in a position to, to fight for the championship and that also, yeah, in these cases, you also learn a lot. Um, especially from your mind and yeah I think that's something you really take into the winter and um yeah your um uh, how how is it called um the um mental strength yeah mental strength um that's one that's that's I mean a huge part you know the driver who has the best mental strength will will also win at the end um and i think that's something um i developed over the winter oh excellent in the stuff. mindset yeah well, excellent stuff the uh, mindset's obviously such a big focal point in modern sports not just in motorsport and it kind of comes to this next yeah. question that we've got here as well with hilo kilo uh wanting to know has a rivalry against ollie berman in italian and adac f4 helped you to become a better driver for sure, for sure. Uh, we had uh, hard battles last year. It was a lot of fun, but um, I really learned a lot. And yeah, it helped. It clearly helped. Well, let's see how that goes for this year. Now, this question comes from Dej. This goes to you. Let's go Percy first and then to you, Chris. Who has the strongest lineup in Freca this season, in your opinion? And I know that's a very tough question. So if you need to get your notes at the ready, uh, Percy, let's let's go to you Ooh. first. Trident, uh, right? Yeah, that's a that's a very tough question. Yes, um, 
Very good question. I think I would maybe go for Prima. Uh, Prima, because their three drivers uh, could all be title contenders. I mean, Paul Aron has the support of Mercedes. He's in his, his, he's in his third season. Uh, he was third last year. So it, anyway, we, we know it's a very, very talented driver. Uh, we have Dino Beganovic, uh, who had a complicated rookie season last year, but uh, who showed that he had the potential, that he had the speed to, to compete for the podiums, for the wins. And uh, he had a quite solid uh, Formula Regional Asia campaign this winter too. And uh, Sebastian Montoya uh, can be maybe the favorite for the rookie title. Uh, First, he's in a, in a Prima, so that helps. Uh, and second, uh, he was incredibly fast in the in Formula Regional Asia this winter. He got uh, he got a couple of wins. He got some triple position in the three meetings he did. So it was uh, incredible, really, really incredible from his side uh, to be able to compete uh, as a rookie against uh, some drivers like Arthur Leclerc, like Isaac Adjar, who knew this car for some months, even some years for some, and to, to beat all of them in, the, in his first three rounds, it was really impressive. And uh, I think, yeah, the Prima Trio could be the most dangerous, although I have to say Arts GP and uh, MP Motorsport are quite, uh, are quite solid too. Yeah, there are some really good lineups in there. Chris, how about yours? Oh, it's, it's, it's a hard one to answer for me. Um, I mean, look, there's so many good lineups. As Percy, Percy put it very well there, there's a lot of good lineups up and down the fields. Um, hard to pick one that stands out, in all honesty. I think you can say a good thing about every single team on the grid, really, particularly, uh, you know, eight or nine who are, could become race winners throughout the throughout the season. Uh, uh, ART look like they have a strong lineup. If I had to just go with one and talk about one team, I think uh, they've got a good lineup this year. Gabrielli Mini looks like the driver that won Italian F4 again this season, carrying a lot of confidence. Mary Boyer showed that he could fight for race wins at the end of last season. Uh, Lawrence Van Hopen has has taken a similar route to David Vidalis in doing gearbox karting and then coming straight into Frecker. And uh, it seems to be working for him just like it did for for David Vidales as well. So, um, yeah, I couldn't pick a, a best team, uh, but if I just had to talk about one, uh, I'll, I'll talk about ART. I, th- I think they're going to be a good one to watch this year, definitely. Well, it's encouraging to hear so many teams being potentially up there. And Tim, is there a particular reason why Trident are the best team this year? Yeah, I mean, uh, the team is doing a very good job and um, we have also... Uh, yeah, I think the team has good drivers too. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's a couple of good drivers there, right, Tim? <laughs> now, this question again comes from Hilo Kilo, and they want to know, what is your favourite track and your most hated track that you've raced on in F4? Oh, well, that, that's a good question. Um, most loved really is quite like... common, right, but the most hated, I like that part of it. Yeah, um, I really like Red Bull Ring. Um, especially like the second and third sector, you have like a flow you're in. Um, in Sanford too, you get like in a really nice flow when you drive, and it's really enjoyable. And yeah, worst track or track that I hate. Um, I would say I think I don't hate any of the tracks. Um, I think I would just go for. Mugello because it was quite difficult result wise there last year um, but the track itself is is um, I mean it's a, it's a very special track you know uh, I think there's no track in the world which is like Mugello and that's a part I like but um, result wise I have to go with Mugello it was the difficultest weekend last year there yeah, that's a clever answer. It's, it's difficult to, to hate some particular tracks, but you might find some more difficult than others. I can say that as an expert of the video game F1 2021, that I do yeah. struggle at some <laughs> versus others, and in iRacing too. Um, now, Luke C, we touched on this earlier as well, Tim, but Luke C has asked, 
how does one train both mentally and physically for Freca, considering the field is so stacked? Um, yeah, well, I, I, pre I try to recover over the winter for sure. Um, also because of the injuries I had from, from the end of last year, from the testing crash. Um, so yeah, I was in France um, quite often at three to one perform to train there and did mental training. Um, yeah, also strength training for sure, because it's a bit different than F4. Um, but I think, um, yeah, like I already said, the, the mental training is a really big point. And also the last season gave me a lot of self-confidence, which I uh, can take into the season, of course. I'm not surprised you have that self-confidence. And you touched on it earlier, or Percy touched on it earlier, just about the weight of the car. Is that something that you are noticing when you when you jumped into the, the, the car this year for the testing, just how different it feels? I mean, um, yeah, for sure you feel a difference um, compared to the F4 because obviously the F4 car is very light. And um, But anyway, it's a really nice car. Um, I really like to drive it. But um, it's definitely not easy um, to overtake. Um, but I would say it's also a bit caused uh, by the dirty air the cars already have. Um, yeah, yeah. Chris, is that something that the drivers you've seen previously making that step up have had to adapt to? And the quicker they can do it, the better it is? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the guys that jumped up uh, towards the end of last season, so... Uh, the likes of Sami Megatunif, Delano Van Hoff. You know, speaking to all the drivers throughout, yeah, the main thing that people struggled with was actually the weight of the car, to be honest. Uh, it, the aerodynamics was, wasn't was really something they talked about too much when I used to speak to the drivers. Uh, it was really that the car was so, so heavy and coming up from an F4 car. Um, that was one that they had to just try and get their heads around, really. I know around Mugello particularly, that was... Uh, a struggle for them because it's a fast and flowing circuit uh, and in a heavy car some of them were finding it quite difficult so um, yeah I, I think that's that's something that they have to get used to but yeah following each other around in the aerodynamics this is going to be their first real test of of that I, I know with F4 you can race quite closely uh, in this not quite the case so uh, so yeah we'll see how they get on. Well at least for Tim you've got Mugello right at the end of the season when you've got comfortable with the car. <laughs> yeah yeah, I think, um, yeah, again, with the weight, um, it's something you get used to. I think um, at the beginning, maybe the car feels a bit more lazy than than the F4 car. But, um, I mean, that's something you get used to. And, yeah. Adaptability is key for drivers, of course. So if you can get used to it. Yeah, who knows how far we could yeah. go. Percy, is there something you heard when you spoke to the drivers at the testing that I like Tim as well about the weight? You mentioned it earlier. It was a broad traffic. Up, traffic, 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 traffic. It was uh, uh, each time I talked to a driver, the main topic was traffic, not push to pass. No, it was traffic, and it's understandable when you have nearly forty drivers. I've uh, on several rounds, I think we may have uh, 40 drivers. Uh, we had the 40 drivers in testing. So, yeah, it's it's very difficult for the drivers to find a clean lap, to, uh, to, to manage to have a clean lap um, and to maximize everything because there are always someone blocking around, uh, so, someone in a co uh, cool down lap. Uh, it's extremely difficult. Fortunately, uh, it's, uh, for the qualifying, it won't be that much of a problem because there will be the 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 field will be split into into two groups, and there will be two groups of like uh, 18, 20 drivers, and it will reduce very much the traffic. So it's going to be a problem for the free practice sessions, but for the qualifying, it should not be a problem. So that's that's really positive, I think. Uh, the championship organizer have uh, understand really the problem, the critics that there were on the on the championship. Uh, they understood that there were problems with the overtakes. So when they introduced they introduced push to pass, they understood there were problems with uh, all, um, sorry with uh, traffic, and they introduced the two groups of qualifying. So I think it's 
uh, it's really great. It's really great that the championship is going into the right direction. Uh, obviously, there are some little problems for of that uh, because the drivers always need to learn how to manage the traffic. It's one of the uh, it's useful in every championship from F1 to uh, to uh, 24 hours of Le Mans to IndyCar. There's always traffic, and obviously, it's a big part of the of motorsport, at least for the qualifying, to to know how to manage traffic. So it's a bit a pity that uh, to have two groups of qualifying, it will reduce uh, the, the capacity the, and uh, the importance of managing the traffic, but it will, be, it will set more representative times for the qualifying. So yeah, anyway, nothing is always all good. There are always some um, side effects, but uh, I think it's a good option. Chris, you touched on it earlier, just how the championship does seem to adapt to feedback. Is that something you're quite proud to be part of? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was something that they uh, realised they're a brand new championship and the only way they're going to improve is by listening to the teams. And yeah, they, they take pride in it, definitely, from, from, what I, from what I gathered working with them. Uh, they were fantastic to work with. And I think it's just gone to show the, the work that's been done over the winter uh, the championship has welcomed back 36 drivers signed up already. So, you know, it, it's obviously, the teams have obviously enjoyed being a part of it. Uh, but the changes, like Percy talked about there, they're, they're only doing them to, to help the teams and the drivers. Uh, like this, like I said earlier, they recognise they're a feeder series uh, and they just want want to help, want to do things that help the teams and the drivers uh, ultimately. And, uh, and that's what they're doing. And yeah, to be a part of that is absolutely great. It makes my job... Uh, a lot more fun, a lot more easy. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited to to get down to Monza. So yeah, bring it on. Add another line of qualifying on your invoice, right? So you get two every single time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've got to be honest. So when I saw the two groups, I was, I, I, I like just having the one qualifying session, uh, having the, having a time then go down and having to go to another group as, as a commentator, if I was being incredibly selfish, uh, I, I'd, I'd encourage to have one group, but uh, 40 cars around the Red Bull ring would be a bit scary, I think for anyone. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's a sensible decision as much as I love just having that one uh, kind of 15, 20 minute session uh, uh, for a qualifying. 40 cars around a, what, three, three kilometer-ish Monaco. That's yeah. one that I'd like to see. Wow, that'd be nice. Yeah, so that was the only, the only track last year where we had the two, the two groups. Uh, other than that, we, we, didn't, we didn't have any. And Red Bull Ring, we didn't have any there. So, and that got a bit sketchy, um, as you can imagine. Um, drivers, I, I find, seem to all find themselves within a start-finish straight in a qualifying session. Even the, three quarters of the track will be free. And all the drivers are together. I don't know how it happens, but it seems to happen all the time. Always inevitable. Now, we're in the last couple of questions now. Now, this one comes via Discord from a name that I don't think is a real name. It's Flourish Vishmon. Has Tim Tramnitz ever had Tim Tams? Maybe they're Australian and want to know about the, the candy Tim Tams. You aware of this, Tim? Oh, honestly, I, I, I never heard of it. I haven't heard of it. You've been a perfect. I, I, from what I understand, it's an Australian chocolate bar biscuit. I don't know if you guys know Chris Percy, but the the Australian, no, okay. Australians go nuts for it. So I think Tim Trams and Tim Tams are a perfect marketing ploy. So go over to Australia, speak to Daniel Ricardo okay. or something, and you'll uh, you'll have marketing yeah. sorted. I need to try them this year. Then yeah, yeah. try see if you can get some Australian guys to to get you some. Um, final question now, and we touched on it a little bit earlier as well. It comes from simply the mysterious S on Discord. Who will be champion? So one driver, one name. Who's it going to be? Let's go with you first, Chris. Oh, that's uh, that's unfair. You got to remember, I go and sit. I'm over in the paddock. Uh, I I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. It's a really unfair answer, but all I'll say is I don't think there's going to be a runaway champion. I think we're going to go to the last race of the season. Um, who that's going to be, I honestly have no idea. Uh, and that's honestly the, the best part of, of being a part of the championship. No idea. But I don't think there'll be one dominant force throughout it. I think there's going to be several different winners throughout the season. 
So I hate to avoid it, but I, I, just, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's be. the audience are probably shouting at me for not pushing you, but I understand it completely, especially with your precarious position, having to speak to a lot of yeah, these guys. Yeah, you got to when I get to the track, <laughs> I go and see everyone. So I'm not, I'm not giving the commentators curse. I'm not giving the commentators curse. So <laughs> there you go. That's why I'm not doing it. Well, you're. You are the true politician after all of that. Tim, is the answer very easy? Is it just Tim Tramnitz? Yeah, of course. I have to go with myself. I appreciate that and I understand it. Percy, though, it's a little bit different for you. You can be a little bit more, not necessarily biased, but tell your true feelings. Uh, first of all, I don't agree totally with Chris because last year already uh, we thought the, the field was really stacked, really tight. And we didn't think that one driver uh, could fly away with the title and we need three races in three, three, four, three, four races in advance. And finally, it happens uh, with Grégoire Saucy. So uh, I think uh, it's hard. It's hard that I, I'm going to go for Gabriele Mini uh, because he has really impressed me. We know totally his potential. We have seen it in Italian F4. We know that he has... Uh, a very strong managing coaching team. Uh, he's in a incredibly, uh, in incredibly good team with uh, with RGP, who has won the title with Martins with Sosi. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, Gabriel Mini, but obviously, obviously, as a as a French fan, I will hopefully uh, uh, be cheering for Adrian David. But uh, yeah, I, I think Gabriel Mini may have. Yeah, advantage. Well, I'm going to go with Gabby uh, Bortoletto as well, just for the fact that Gabriel joined the podcast. So there's a little bias for you as well. But Tim, I'll have to champion you now <laughs> as part of the FMC's <laughs> podcast alumni. So we've got we've got Tim Tramnitz, we've got Bortoletto, and we've got Mini, and then we've got a Boris Johnson esque answer from Chris of I don't know. Well, all I'll say is right. Well, the reason I don't I don't is because. With Gregor last year, I think he, he, he had, you know, a few years of experience. And I think that helped him get his head around the car quicker than everyone else. Uh, this year, that's not that's not the case. Uh, we've had a year of, of the car. So that's the reason I, I don't think, I think people have had a chance to get their head around the car now. And uh, it's going to be too close to call, in my opinion. Too close to call sounds like the perfect champion to me, because that means we've got a really good championship. So fingers crossed that's the case. But at the moment, I have to say thank you to everybody for listening. That's all the time we have this week. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And if you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. And if you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insights and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas, and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.